Hello, I'm Eric Meyer, and I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. I'm Brian Cardell. I'm also a developer advocate at Egalia. And uh, this week on Egalia Chats, we're going to do a time-honored tradition, the mailbag episode. Pretty much, uh, you know, people have sent us questions or made observations, and we're going to riff on those this week. Yeah, I think every week or so, Eric and I get together and talk about like, okay, what's our next, uh, you know, Egalia chat? Who are we going to schedule to have on if we're having somebody on? And we have a list of them that are pending. And we thought, well, I don't know, we what could we do? And Eric suggested, well, let's just toot and, and ask, what do people think we should do? And a whole bunch of people wrote in, uh, yeah. either via Mastodon or through private channels to suggest things and ask questions. So yeah, we're just going to talk about those. There's some good ideas in there. Well, yeah, we got enough uh, good ideas that I think we'll do this again in the future. Yeah. So somebody suggested, um, let's see, it was Finn Becker hmm. suggested that accessibility might be an interesting topic. Firstly, because of the discredit thrown around by one Jacob Nielsen, mm. but more importantly, because the upcoming 2025 deadline for private sector businesses to comply with the European Accessibility Act. Yeah. Um, we agree. That is a good show. And in fact, we have been talking about doing at least one accessibility episode with some uh, accessibility people on our team. Uh, so that is actually one of the ones that's pending, but um we're, we had a kind of a different spin on that in mind. We d hadn't been thinking about talking about the deadline for businesses to comply or anything. So maybe we should also do a show that's more along the lines of what this one says in the future. Yeah. I mean, that question was actually the first that I had heard of this upcoming 2025 deadline. Um, yeah. I try to be uh, aware of accessibility and I try to make sure that the things that I do are accessible, um, not as... Uh, steeped in the community as as many. Um, yeah. It's not sort of my primary area of focus. Uh, CSS still claims that spot for me, but yeah, I mean that's very interesting uh, that there there is a deadline apparently next year for private sector businesses to comply. I I don't want to speak too in depth on this because uh, mm -hmm. I don't know much depth, but you know a reason why we'll probably do an episode about it. We'll have someone on who actually knows what this is all about and what the deal is. Um, and then we can learn along with everyone. We could maybe for listeners who aren't familiar with what the uh, shade thrown by Jacob Nielsen is referring to. Um, do you know what that was about? Basically Jacob Nielsen, who Famous was really a order. groundbreaker in yeah. user experience, like research and, thought you know 20 25 years ago mm -hmm. nielsen norman and you know, jacob nielsen and don norman basically created a consultancy and really blazed a lot of trails and really did a lot of groundbreaking work in that area but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that jacob is an expert in all things and jacob recently published an article basically saying accessibility has failed everything is bad ai will fix it and a lot yeah. of accessibility experts said whiskey tango foxtrot dude <laughs> so so uh leone watson our friend had mm. a uh pretty great takedown of that in a way which was like basically her saying about how she thought about this like all day long as she did all these tasks on her computer mm. you know like she just walked through her day like i thought about it while i did this and i thought about it while i did that and i thought about it while i did that and, you know, all these things are the things she does on the web and she is blind. And so saying that it's a complete failure is obviously wrong, right? Like it's just observably wrong. Yeah. But I think there's a point, like sometimes a point gets made poorly. And I do think that it could be better for sure, right? And I don't think that even, I don't think that Leone disagrees with that even, you know, like, I mean, yeah. I've seen... We, yes. we have presented things together that is like, well, accessibility is actually unfortunately harder than it should be in a lot of mm -hmm. cases. Mm -hmm. And we should work on that. Yeah. A, a lot of the people who responded to the article said things along those lines of, yes, things could be better, but the solution proposed here is terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think is, is what it got down to because, you know, expecting quote unquote AI 
uh, and I'm going to put the quotes around it because, you know, from what I saw, Jacob was mostly talking about things like large language models to generate completely user centric interfaces, Mm. you know, and the point was immediately made by other people. So you're saying that every single person will have their own UI. Mm. How is that going to work? Like, how is anyone supposed to ever help anyone else do anything? That is kind of interesting. This is a thing that gets thrown around a lot, like on that respect specifically, because like, uh, how is anybody supposed to help anybody do anything? How is it supposed to work when you call tech support if you don't have the same interface? But like, right. it's very common that you don't have the same interface because you have like an iPhone and a iPad and your laptop and your computer with the big screen. In responsive design, those may be very different things, right? They may be, um, yes, but they would be consistent from one similar device to another. Sure, whereas, sure. Whereas yeah, I think Jacob's but, talking about is literally everybody gets their own, you know, software constructed. Yeah, something. I mean. Even reading it, I was like, I don't think Jacob knows how this would work either. I don't know that he's thought about it that far. Yeah, but, I don't think so either. Anyway. Um, Jacob Nielsen, I used to follow him very closely, and I remember thinking for my whole life you know i mean not my whole life your whole professional life yeah my whole professional life i've i've kind of followed his work and i i just remember always thinking when i would read his things his website is so ugly how can i take advice <laughs> from this guy but yeah he he did have like a lot of good research and i think don norman is the guy who wrote like the design of everyday things isn't that correct right? yes that is a really good book i thought yeah. um i i enjoyed that um there's so many good sort of practical things in there that people still don't pay attention to i point out like the door example i don't know how we design doors so poorly right <laughs> still it, it seems so obvious once you read that book is like of course this means pull mm -hmm. and still somehow we get where it's not that way and i guess i don't know i mean i guess to an extent that is like built in I don't know. Maybe, maybe we should move on. That that could yeah. be a whole show of its own. Um, yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, uh, Dan, who is uh, on the MathML working group with me, mm. okay, uh, wrote in to say, uh, top of mind. I'm curious if anyone in browser land or Agalia land wants to comment on the White House memo, future software should be memory safe. I know you recently had a servo conversation mentioning Rust. Maybe there could also be conversation mentioning C++ and various security risks. And given the memo, are there long-term maintenance risks? I was not aware of this memo. Were you aware of it? I had become aware of it maybe half a day before Dan asked the question. And mostly it had just, I had seen that it was a thing. Uh, but I hadn't really gone and looked at it um, yet. And then Dan's question prompted me to go look at it. Yeah, we mentioned Servo because, um, well, we're interested in it, but also because the Gallia is working on it. Mm -hmm. And um, this week, coincidentally enough, mm -hmm. uh, two things happened. Um, well, I guess three things. One, uh, we led a W3C breakout session on how we fund the web platform. And uh, I guess two is I wrote a blog post about it. Yeah. And three is uh, we launched a collective for funding Servo. Yep. And you can go donate some money to that or better try to convince your company to do that. Yeah. And spread the word and that sort of yep. thing. But the reason that it fits in here and why Dan brought it up is that, you know, we've talked about Servo. And Servo is written in Rust, and mm -hmm. Rust is designed to be memory safe. Mm -hmm. Many other things, but memory safety is one of the core design principles of Rust as a language. So, yeah, I mean, if future software should be memory safe, then languages like Rust are uh, good languages to use for implementing things. My understanding is that C++ is not memory safe in any way whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, it is not memory safe. Um... <laughs> The reason that I tie those things together is I wanted to make the same point that I made in my blog post about it, which is um, better if you get your, your company to invest in Servo. There's a lot of good reasons for your company to invest in, in Servo. Mm. Uh, or better yet, uh, if you know somebody who works at the White House, 
tell them that there is, you know, one surefire way to make sure that lots and lots and lots of future software is memory safe. That would be to invest in a web engine that is hmm. memory safe because it's written in Rust. And there's only one of those. Yeah. So, you know, send them a link to the collective and say, we'll be waiting for the check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, for that matter, if this is truly an important thing, which I would tend to agree, software should be memory safe. I mean, in general, it's also for national security reasons, perhaps, but software should just be memory safe. Then putting some funding into languages like Rust, right? They are also largely advanced by groups that are looking for funding. Mm -hmm. And the more support that goes into memory safe languages, not languages that are having memory safe sort of wedged into them, but languages that are just memory safe from the outset mm -hmm. uh, would be a good thing. And certainly a web engine, I mean, uh, as was said, I mean, it's been said by many people, but as we said in our presentation on funding the web ecosystem, the web is now infrastructure for 5 billion people. That is over half the entire human population. And there's probably a decent chunk of the other 3 billion people who do not directly rely on the web, but mm -hmm. things that they rely on rely on the web. It's indirect infrastructure for probably a decent chunk of, of the 3 billion that were not included in that 5 billion. And it's really important that we treat the web like the civilizational infrastructure it, is, it has become and is continuing to become. Absolutely. Um, and treat it on par with things like electricity. Roads. You know, yeah, roads, definitely like roads. You know, treat it like roads. And I know that not everywhere treats roads great. I mean, I, you and I live in the land of potholes. so, um, <laughs> But they're still maintained. They may not be maintained as perfectly as we would like, but they are still maintained. And so things like web engines are now really much more critical than, oh, it lets me watch YouTube. I think actually those of us in the industry tend not to realize it. We tend not to realize how critical these things that we work with and sometimes curse at for, you know, not doing exactly what we wanted to do have become. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, should there be, should there be in the same way that there's public radio and mm -hmm. public television, should there be public web engine? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not ready to jump to one conclusion or the other. But I'm leaning pretty more heavily in towards yes these days. Yeah. And I mean, what's really amazing about it is that like, you know, when we talk about like public radio, I mean, here we have like a, a in, in the US, we have national public radio and that mostly gets like some tax breaks, I think. It's very little of it is actually funded nationally. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it is funded by sponsorships, fund drives, things yep. like that. Yep. Um, we could fund it uh, any number of similar ways, but also we don't even have to limit it to a single country because <laughs> this is infrastructure for the entire world, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So like if every country kicked in a little bit toward that, it would, I mean, probably be almost as much as any of the big companies make. <laughs> yeah, probably. But again, <laughs> this is a, this is a thing we could do a whole show, probably more than one whole show yeah, yeah. about. So we should move along. I, I'm, I'm going to introduce the next one. Peter Rushforth said, uh, waiting for the day when maps are the topic. Yeah. Speaking of government, Peter Rushforth works for a part of the Canadian government that is um, concerned with maps. And uh, he has been, I'll, I'll give you the context for this. He believes that we should have maps in HTML. Like, shouldn't there be like, uh, well, there is a map element. Yeah, I was going to say, is, like actual geographic maps as opposed to the area right. map elements. That's right. And uh, he has been working with a community group. It's a, a kind of a small group, I think, but they have been working for 10 years on trying to make like some kind of polyfill. You know, it's a custom element. And a, a lot of what they had, at least four years ago or so was um, like it, it involved a, a protocol, you know, so it was like involved something more like, you know, activity pub, but for maps, you know what I mean? Uh, so it like, it has like a whole protocol 
that goes along with it because you know maps are like that right like when you get geographic information a lot of times you need to get a particular zoom of it with particular features and communicate back and forth to the server so so yeah it's a it's an interesting problem they've been working on it for a long time and there was an effort to there was a w3c workshop a couple of years ago that Igalia attended and produced a position paper on. But yeah, I think that there is room actually for some maps related stuff in HTML in the web. And I would like to see something happen there. I think the challenge is like a lot of different people want sort of different things out of that. And I think that there are uh, challenges getting everybody on board to the same page. And also like it's complex, right? Like it's very, very complex. So I had some ideas. Uh, I know uh, Amelia Bellamy Royds, who's from, you know, SVG and CSS fame, mm -hmm. uh, also did some consulting work on that and also had some ideas. She helped run the um, organize and run the workshop. But yeah, that could be an interesting show. I don't know. Maybe at some point we could do a show on that. Yeah. Maps are clearly a major use case on the web. And on yeah, you know, for everybody, right? Right. Even if um like a lot of the mapping stuff in your phone, mm -hmm. your mobile device, whatever, um, is web driven. It's not like running at the internet layer, it's sort of running at the web layer. And mm -hmm. so yeah, it feels like this is a sort of thing that maybe there should be native elements um, to describe this. And then the other part of me is like, mm, yeah, but there are so many other things that could be like that. Like, how far do we want to take this? Maybe custom elements are the way to go. It's great that that's where they're starting. Um, yeah. And don't get me wrong. I love maps. Like, I have loved maps for a long time. Like, the aesthetics of them, the utility of them. Of course, you and I come from an era when maps were printed in books that you <laughs> bought in gas stations and you kept in yeah. your car <laughs> and, and had to, spent hours trying to get back into the right shape. Right, exactly. You had to learn how to fold them or you had to decide that you just didn't care. And eventually the wrong way folds would cause them to rip and develop holes. And then you would eventually replace them. Planning a route on a piece of, you know, on basically on paper with a highlighter, Mm -hmm. All that kind of thing, I have always really enjoyed and appreciated maps. So, you know, for me to have them be more native to the web, like I would, I would find that awesome at a personal level. So, yeah, it would be really interesting. But it, the map groups effort remind me a lot of Math ML, mm, yeah, where there's a sort of a small core of dedicated people trying to push something that's they feel is really important and you know, have done work with essentially polyfills, whether those are custom elements or using uh, JavaScript the way that, um, crap, I just lost it. The <laughs> the JavaScript library that, that will take like text syntax and turn it into either an SVG or a... It's like one of those like LaTeX to HTML, like, you know, yeah. it, it's like a... Stuff like conversion that. Conversion library from one to another. Kind mm -hmm. of. Yeah. So it would be very interesting to see advancement in that area. Yeah. So uh, let's see, moving forward, uh, Eric Portis, uh, another friend of ours, mm -hmm. um, the web as an input and output of AI. Uh, yeah. Biggest web. He, he had several. <laughs> well, let's, let's start with the first one. I, okay. The web is definitely being used as an input to AI. Uh, I think or, too big a topic should be its own show. Well, we probably. Do. And yeah. when we say AI really here, we're, we mean large language models. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there really isn't a larger source of language than trying to snarf up the entire web. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then using that to be the output of your large language model. And I've seen various people do things like, we're using chat GPT to generate layouts. Just describe the layout that you want and it will spit something out. And that sometimes works. But um, Simon Wilson um, was recently writing a, or posting somewhere about how they needed to do something in CSS. They weren't 
uh, sure how to do it. So they used one of the large language models, like Simon uses every single large language model available. So I don't know if it was ChatGPT or or what it was. I don't remember. But what Simon said was, so I told it what I wanted to do, and it spit out CSS that was wrong. But it was close enough to write that it got me the rest of the way. And that was, I don't know, interesting in a sense. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, like, sometimes that's really great. I've heard a lot of other interesting, like, feedback on that. Like, you know, if, if you, like, basically, you're you're doing that in isolated places, right? Like, so you're you're like, I'm stuck. I need something here, and it is not sort of aware of your whole rest of your code base. If you have something that like solves parts of those problems already, like you already have functions somewhere, so you know it, it's gonna solve that problem sort of in a vacuum, and then like what ends up happening is like there's large amounts of repeated code, you know, it, it tends to, it tends to get not very dry at all. Yeah. And you wind up with like obscure bugs in potentially many places. Hmm. Uh, so other questions that he asked, uh, HTTP does a gal, you work on it at the IETF. Um, so we don't uh, really work on the IETF on HTTP itself, uh, except sort of passively. There are some things that we have gone and worked on there, but we do have people who do implementation, but we, we do maintain uh, the library that like WPE uses for, and I think Epiphany as well. Um, are you thinking of LibSoup? LibSoup, yes. Delicious, delicious LibSoup. Mm. Mm. LibSoup. It's made of all the freshest libs. <laughs> when they're in season anyway he also had a documenting teaching learning web development in 2024 yeah there's a lot of a lot of things are either degrading or shutting down you know people have been getting mad at mdn recently because it's you know mozilla has done things that they don't like there's that but you know eric Portis also mentioned uh, an event apart, which closed its doors at the end of 2021. Uh, a book apart, which is has not closed its doors, but is shifting to no longer producing new books, basically maintaining its back catalog. And that's it. Um, CSS tricks. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of commentary about how, you know, DigitalOcean bought it and promised to do a lot of great things with it and has not done many if any of those things, and you know, there's no new content showing up there. Um, my feeling is that documenting, teaching, learning web development, I mean, MDN is still kind of the go-to, but beyond that, it's really uh, much like uh, social networking for many of us has become decentralized. Mm -hmm. You don't anymore go to, you know, a list apart for a long time it was just everybody was subscribed to that. And when they published a new article, people were talking about it and they haven't published a new article in a while. And it's the same sort of thing. You don't have just one place to go. You know, Smashing Magazine is maybe the closest you get to that. But I don't see a lot of people regularly talking about articles in Smashing. People will regularly talk about, hey, I just saw the CSS article. And then it turns out to be from some website that you've never been to before. Or, yeah. hey, you know, check out this code pen that shows this really cool JavaScript trick, you know, or web.dev. Um, yeah. Getting a lot of, a lot of stuff and investment and it's all Google mainly, but that's um, true. Um, there is, there is some there, but you know, again, it's, we're not any longer in the era of single points of conversation. It's very much more like the very earliest days of blogging where, you would see on somebody's blog, hey, I was just at this other site, and you'd you know jump around, and there were web rings and things like that, and there wasn't yeah. there wasn't any one place to go. Or it feels to me like we're in another phase like that. Yeah. Um, just a reminder: this show is brought to you by Agalia, who are proud sponsors of Open Web Docs. You can support the web platform documentation of the web that is exists on MDN and is written by uh, independent contributors. We really love it. Uh, OpenCollective.com slash open-web-docs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the the biggest web platform regrets was his last question. Yep. 
I yeah, I wanted to say that like uh, when I saw this, I I felt like I I've seen just the same day even a thing that was maybe it was the day before. Um, Kent C. Dodds had asked a, a related question, but it's different, right? And it was like if you could break backward compatibility on the web, what are things you would break and why? And I mean, like it's not the same question, you know. Mm. But it it does have like this similar like if I could go back in time sort of aspect to it, and for me it's headings I think, you know like it's like H one H two H three H four H five H six like the thing that irritates me the most about them is that it's a bad idea and we knew it was a bad idea from the moment that the web existed. There was a moment in 1991 when Tim Mersley sent the first real email to WWW talk. I always have to say that very carefully in which he was like, had very few commentaries, you know, but one was like, yeah, we should fix that. That's not smart. Like there should probably just be section and H and like the only reason that H1 through H6 exists is because it was part of SGML before that for like 30 years. Mm. And Tim was trying to solve originally sort of chicken and egg problem. I mean, it's like, how do you wind up where you're not in that XKCD comic where like, there are so many competing standards. We should just have one. Let me make a new one. You know, right. now there's just one more. Right. Um, he, he just grabbed across the corpus of existing documents at CERN. And like a lot of them were, this SGML and of course they had all of the things that are most common in text. Right. I mean, like that, that should surprise no one. Right. And so it included all these H's and it, it was flat because of its origins. And the reason it bothers me is because what a lot of people don't see is that there are just like thousands and thousands of person hours that have been spent trying to get that fixed since then and trying to get like accessibility right it's not the way that the web should work right like um you what you want to say is this is a section and this is a heading for the section and it's going to be pulled in via a cms or template constructs or whatever and like the reason that we separate them out like that is because well it will exist in potentially many contexts we don't know right yeah Maybe on the, you know, sort of overview page, it's a, an H4, but in the article itself, it's an H2, you know? Yep. Um, but because of the, like, flat original nature of this and the fact that there are numbers and the fact that there are now so many documents and screen readers and then the fact that we also tried to make this document outline in HTML5. Mm -hmm. and then did sort of the worst possible thing and implemented the CSS that makes it seem like it worked and also like didn't make it a breaking change or anything. And so it's very, very difficult to fix in retrospect now. Like it, it's, I still want to fix it. And, um, <laughs> but it, you know, if I could get that time back from all the people that have worked on the problem, um, I think we can agree there are better things that they could do with their time <laughs> if they could get that time back and the world would be better for it in both respects. So yeah. that, that, so that's mine. It's subtle, but I mean, there's other things. There's so many things, right? Like, right. um, exactly. another one that makes me very sad, for example, is that the, you know, we have like the CSS OM, you know, the CSS object model. Yeah. Yeah. And like, that's nice. You can like get at it. And um, if you wanted to do like something that was like polyfilling or, you know, you wanted to make a CSS like language or something, it's great, but you can't really use it for polyfilling because it throws out things that it doesn't understand. <laughs> so like the parser doesn't build the CSS OM for stuff it doesn't understand. And I think that's really regrettable. It's like made mm. some things a lot harder than they could be otherwise. But yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. I did look in the replies to Kent Dodds. Mm -hmm. If you could break backwards compatibility, what are the things you would break? A surprising number of people just answered CSS. <laughs> Didn't say what about CSS. And I don't, it wasn't clear if they meant I would just throw away CSS and replace it with something different. Or if they were saying 
I would break backwards compatibility in CSS so that we could fix some things about it. And certainly, I mean, you know, the CSS working group maintains a list of design mistakes in the language. You know, it says at the top, you know, to be fixed if we ever get our hands on a time machine. Mm -hmm. You know, things like the the original box model being content uh, focused rather than border focused. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole reason that the box sizing property exists and a whole bunch of people just say, you know, star box sizing border box because they want everything to be sized by the outer edge of the border. And I get it. I totally get it. And, you know, headings is kind of one of mine too, but you already covered it. So I'm not going to go through that again. I actually, I regret some of the missed stuff in HTML3, not HTML3.2, but HTML3 that had things like a uh, footnote element. Mm. There were a number of really interesting ideas in there that, just didn't happen and have probably been re-implemented by many, many people over the years in many, many different ways, like footnotes and side notes have been re-implemented so many times by people yeah. using, you know, JavaScript or, well, usually just JavaScript. And just, there were, there were a number of things similar to that, that were proposed in HTML3 that did not make it to HTML 3.2 that I wish we could have had because we would have maybe a richer expression. But this, I mean, this whole thing, I mean, this is the nature of the, of the web at the technological level is that you can't really break backwards compatibility. That's just a built-in design principle. Unless you really, really have to. Well, right. So like we broke backward compatibility for HTTP. Yes. Because HTTP was inherently unsafe. And so we moved enough of the needle to HTTPS made it possible enough to convert that gave it enough time to happen mm -hmm. that we finally agreed to we're kind not going to support that yeah. anymore yeah. yeah in general you have to have an extremely extremely compelling reason to break backwards compatibility and by design yeah. the web is supposed to be backwards and forwards compatible in time so this is why a lot of web features take what seems like an inordinately long amount of time to figure out how they're going to work and the amount of bike shedding that happens in the CSS working group, for example, over what should this property be named? This is because the working group is constantly trying to think five, 10 years down the road. If we do X, is that going to close doors that we're going to regret later? Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can never think of every possibility, but there's really a lot of thought put into, you know, is this violating any of these forward or backward compatibility design principles? Um, Nathan Noller wrote in to say, uh, I think this has come up already in some episodes, but maybe a dedicated episode or a series of episodes about how to get involved with web standards. Yeah, that could be a good future episode. Um, in fact, uh, I spoke to someone yesterday about coming on. They agreed to come on. Uh, we could, I'm not going to say who that is yet, but <laughs> we could also maybe, I think Simon Peters would be a good guest for that as well. Um, mm -hmm. He is now at Mozilla, originally was at Opera. He did a thing while he was at Boku, which was the web platform contribution guide, which is very good. I think that would be good to to get him to come on. Yeah. So Seth Roby said, sometimes it seems like web tech assumes you're doing a complete rewrite of your site every couple of years to pick up new stuff. But, you know, it's all amazingly backwards compatible, like we were just talking about. But we rarely talk about how to evolve what you've got in place as the years pass on and your tech debt accumulates. Yeah, I think that's an interesting topic. I, I used to think that myself, like how y'all are writing your apps over and over again with like, oh my God, like I used Backbone and then I switched to Ember and then I switched that to Angular and then, you know, this other thing and then React and then, well, I really like Vue and like, where are y'all getting the opportunities to write so many things? Like, do you work on that many different projects? Because, you know, like, uh, I would be involved in products that had the shortest project I think I've worked on ever was three month window. But, you know, a lot of times there were year projects or multi year projects even. And then you don't have as many opportunities to switch. So you have to you have to kind of get them. You can't just rewrite your entire application over again because there's some cool new thing, you know? Yeah. 
And you're, I guess you, some do, but well, sure. But you, you made a good point about the HTTP archive data. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the HTTP archive, it shows that there's a lot of use of jQuery, but I don't, I don't think that's because so many people are choosing it today. I think it's because that stuff just <laughs> exists in old code, and that code is mature, and we don't want to mess with it. I mean, when we yeah. say mature, sometimes that's code for I'm afraid to touch that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and certainly I, if someone created a site 10 years ago using jQuery and the site's still up, it's probably still running jQuery and jQuery still runs in browsers because forward is and backwards compatible in time. So yeah, it's just, it's going to show up everywhere. And it's that, I think that's what happens. And I, but at the same time, I don't think of at least that aspect of it. I don't think of it as tech debt, right? You've got a site that's running on jQuery. Okay. So your site runs on jQuery. That's not tech debt. I think ongoing active projects that have many pieces when each piece is written in the latest hot new thing. Yeah. That's, that's where the tech debt really stacks up. Yeah. Because over time, more and more, you have to get them to work with each other. You have these, these different pieces. So, you know, does the preact thing talk to the jQuery thing or however it's right. set up? And that, that can be rough. That can I'm be sure. rough. I think in that in that case, I mean, really, your solution is make it work until it doesn't, and then you fix whichever bit broke it. <laughs> it's honestly, and yes, I know. Yeah. Again, that's an accumulation of tech debt all on its own. But I feel like, as with many systems, not just code, but you know, many real world systems, you either have to start from scratch, or you just have to continually adapt. Um, I can say that there is this like there is this mentality in corporate software that like we want to be an X shop, mm, whatever X is, right? Right. Um, not Twitter. It, right, right, right. Not not Twitter. But yeah. but like so for example, I, I worked several jobs in my career that were like, oh, we had all these different solutions on the server tier middleware, but like we want to be a Java shop and we want to be based on. I don't know, Spring or Spring MVC or Struts or, you know, some particular framework. And, you know, maybe that place has like the place that I used to work had like 170 different web applications. And wow. like by the time you start digging into that, well, something in that is going to change, right? <laughs> I mean, like you can't rewrite 170 web applications overnight. Like it took you... 10 15 years to get there in the first place you know yeah and um you know once a lot of things are written like they go into maintenance mode and like they're like they don't maintain the same budget that they took during development a lot of times it's yeah the same 10 people made 20 applications you know what i mean like mm -hmm. but it's a lot easier to maintain an application once it's already running because we do have this like good backward compatibility on the web you know than it is to to keep writing them fresh and and so i have you know faced this where you're trying to look at the problem and like how do you manage this and especially when there is like interesting churn right like i mean so maybe at one point the solution to everything was like jquery and you're like oh this is good jquery and these are good jquery ui and this is j good jquery plugins and then later on it was like well we do actually do a lot of application-y things and maybe those, maybe it's okay if those are like Angular and then you spend some time like figuring out like where the marriage of your, your server side and your client side. And like, I think you just have to, I don't know. I mean, I think it's engineering and breaking down problems uh, and accepting that you're probably never going to get to a hundred percent on any of them, you know? Right. And finding where the big wins are. I mean, I think that is, you know, that's like if you're doing like performance stuff, you know, that's what that's why you say like premature optimization is the real all evil, you know, because, well, I mean, you, you could be spending a really lot of time on something that ultimately doesn't matter very much. Only when the thing is like running and, and you can see it, can you get a really good sense of where the bottlenecks are and you can spend a little bit of time on maybe the most important two or three bottlenecks and suddenly have a system that's 300% more, more efficient and is like, fine, maybe it's not, there's diminishing returns from there, you know? Right. 
I do think the thing that I said about jQuery raises an interesting question in my mind that I have to remember to follow up on. Barry Pollard or Rick Viscomi, if you're listening to the show, <laughs> please write in and let me know if we know the jQuery version distributions that are out there, because that would tell you if we're getting new versions of jQuery or if they're still sort of like the, you know, one, three, one, four versions that are, have been out there for 10 years or more, you know, that would be interesting to know. I think that actually that about wraps it up. We're about out of time, but we can uh, do this again in the future. I think we will. So, you know, if people uh, listening have questions they'd like to hear us address, maybe ping us on the interwebs or drop a comment on uh, YouTube. If you this that's where you listen to uh, Agalia Chasses on YouTube, we'll always happy to see questions there and mm -hmm. um, let us know what you think. Let, let us know if we got any of this wrong because we might have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let us know what you think about the mailbag episode format. Um, if yeah, you, that too. If you enjoy this uh, once in a while or you think uh, it's not actually so interesting because we, I mean, we do have plenty of topics. <laughs> Um, I think we just got another five or six today. Yeah. And the other thing is, um, if we missed your question, because we did not get to at least three or four other people's questions, we just ran out of time. Um, sorry about that. Maybe handle it in a future episode. All right. Thanks. That was, that was fun. Yeah, that was good. Talk to you later. <laughs>